April 20th, 1968, a progressive priest and philosopher named Ivan Illich gave a speech titled To Hell with Good Intentions to a group of American volunteers in Mexico. His main purpose, his main message was that there are deep dangers of paternalism in any voluntary act of service, uh, especially in the international context. He famously ended his speech by saying, and I quote, I'm here to entreat you to come and use your status, use your money and your education to travel in Latin America. Come to look, come to climb our mountains and enjoy our flowers, but do not come to help. My name is Adam Stieglitz, co-founder of the Andean Alliance for Sustainable Development, PhD student at the University of Louisville. And today, 50 years later, I stand here with a similar plea. Now for the sake of full transparency, I was that student. This is me teaching English to a group of middle schoolers in South Korea. Here I am in Honduras helping a group of missionaries translate at a medical clinic. This is me surveying people about access to clean water in El Salvador. <clears throat> I became so passionate about the idea of service that I eventually enrolled in the Middlebury Institute of International Studies to get a master's degree in international development and public administration. While there, I recruited this group of students to head down to Peru and help two high altitude indigenous communities build greenhouses at their local schools. And that's exactly what we did. This is a greenhouse in a community called Pocus. Here's one in Pampa Corral. Now, while building greenhouses were most certainly our main intent for that summer, there was also an unintended consequence. It ended up being so beneficial for us as students to have the opportunity to take all of the lessons that we were learning in our classroom and apply it in the field. We realized that we were onto something, and we eventually thought it was a good idea to formalize an organization around this idea of converging international development with experiential learning. Upon our return to campus, we were intentional about leveraging all of our coursework, our peers, and our faculty to creating our organization. By the time I graduated, we had, formed, we had officially started the Andean Alliance for Sustainable Development. At that point, I pretty much sold everything that I had, took out whatever loans I could, moved down to Calca, Peru, and dedicate myself to the mission of our organization. Now, the Indian Alliance has two primary pillars. First, we're an agriculture organization. We partner with high altitude indigenous communities like these, and we collaborate on projects to grow vegetables in altitudes where vegetables simply shouldn't grow. We work with schools, we train students on how to grow vegetables, and we also partner with families and small scale farmers on family greenhouse projects. The second pillar of our organization is experience learning. Um, having the opportunity to apply the concepts, theories, skills that we were learning in the classroom in the field added so much value to our education that we wanted to continue offering that opportunity to other students. So we partner with universities and we create programs in Peru where students can come down and apply their studies with our organization. And it takes various forms. Sometimes it's programmatic. This is a group of students carrying a roll of plastic to help roof a greenhouse. Sometimes it's investigative. This is a student uh, giving a survey uh, to learn more about the challenges associated with access and connectivity. Sometimes it's skill-based. This is a group of engineering students and their faculty helping a community facing irrigation challenges measure water flow. Here's the thing. I've been facilitating these programs for a while. I've, I've worked on over on dozens of programs, worked with over 200 students. And I can safely say that there's been one major takeaway for me, and it is that in international service learning, the student always wins. No matter what, the student will benefit. You can spend an entire year planning these programs, and they can go complete, exactly as planned, or they can go completely awry. The student will win. But what about the community, right? How do, how do communities win? That question started to consume me, and I started to have doubts about the programs that we were running. I started to have these existential questions like, is it even possible for, campus, for communities to win when they converge with, with campuses? Like, is there any value in the campus community partnership? It were those questions that led me to eventually enroll in a PhD program at the University of Louisville, where I currently research the campus community partnerships through a lens of equity and reciprocity. One of the things that I've learned since starting my studies is that the two generally widely accepted outcomes that we should be aspiring for in international service learning are mutual benefit and transformation. 
right? In other words, a win-win situation. Actors from both sides should come together and achieve some type of long-term positive change. However, I know based on my experience that we can challenge that, right? I can't help but challenge that. I mean, what does mutual benefit even mean in this context? It's easy to define how students win, right? There's academic outcomes from applying their studies in the field, personal and professional growth, newfound perspectives as it relates to their political, social, economic worldview. But what about communities? What's the, what's the parallel for them? And when we say transformation, like who are we really talking about? Is it really that campuses and communities get, become transformed from these relationships? The answer to these questions is that in international service learning, the student will always win, but unfortunately that's not always the case for communities. And here's why. First, we take a deficit-based approach. Okay? We focus on community weaknesses instead of their strengths. We see things like people living in mud brick homes, or we see farmers with dirty clothes and dirt under their nails, and we automatically think that what they need is home improvement or hygiene classes. The problem with this type of approach to service learning is it's susceptible to sending a message that you are not capable of taking control of your own development. And further, that we have the answer. We know a better way for you to live. And that's not transformative, it's the opposite. Uh, and frankly, it's misinformed. Why don't we highlight the fact that these people literally made every brick in that home, or that they built it together as a community, or that the farmer that has dirt under her nails is there because he's been harvesting food to support his own family. I mean, these are strengths that we should be learning from in these programs, but we choose not to. The second reason why communities don't always benefit in international service learning is because it inherently sends this message that you need our help. Right? You, poor community, needs our help. Now, it's not my intention to diminish the altruistic or benevolent intent of service. Right? I admire it, and as we saw before, that was me. But sometimes we overlook the fact that these communities in the global south, they still suffer from a legacy of colonialism. Right? It wasn't that long ago that people from the global north showed up on their land uninvited right, with a message on a better way to live. We saw how that turned out. It's not far-fetched to say that international service learning is a direct descendant of that type of attitude or behavior. Let's take an example. This is me giving a, giving a workshop on agriculture to a group of indigenous Peruvians. Can we not take a second to acknowledge how ridiculous that is? <laughs> okay, I've taken workshops on organic farming. I've volunteered on farms. I've read all the books. But these people have been farming for generations. And they've grown enough food to support an entire civilization. Okay. Should it not be me learning from them? This is a classic case of me thinking that I'm there to help, but in reality, I'm the one that's benefiting from being exposed to this rich and vibrant culture. And when we say transformation, I feel like that's actually the type of experience that we're talking about. Finally, the third reason why communities don't always benefit in international service learning is because, as its name implies, international service learning it's the campuses and the students that are providing a service, therefore communities that are the beneficiary. But in hindsight, we can challenge that, right? Let's take a look at a few photos and ask ourselves who's really benefiting here, or here, or here, or here. I'll tell you who's benefiting, it's the students. And frankly, it comes at an, at an expense for these local communities, right? Time, money, resources, energy, opportunity cost. These are the things that communities are, are sacrificing for students to have that experience. So if that's the case, you could actually argue that in international service learning, it's the students who are the beneficiaries, and therefore the, the communities that are service providers. But we choose not to see it that way. Now, it's not my intention to stand up here and be critical of international service learning, but I do intend to, be a, to critique it. If mutual benefit and transformation is what we're aspiring for, then we need to shift our attitudes a little bit, right? We need to stop focusing on community weaknesses and start highlighting their strengths. Exposing students to the richness of these communities, right, the way that they're sustainable, resourceful, the way that they have a low carbon footprint, the way that they're happy without having a lot of economic means, that's a powerful learning experience for students and it's also empowering for communities, something that's typically absent from the international service learning model. 
right? We need, to, we, need to, we need to stop flexing our savior muscles and start recognizing that we have a lot that we can actually learn from communities in the global south, right? We, we have to recognize that when we say transformation, really what we're talking about is a powerful, applied, international, cross-cultural, adventurous learning experience for our students. And frankly, it's the communities that are the gatekeeper to that. And finally, we need to shed our egos and accept that in international service learning, it's actually the students who are the primary beneficiaries and not necessarily the communities. And if that's the case, frankly, they should be compensated or rewarded accordingly. So the title of my presentation today is New Perspectives in International Service Learning, Achieving Transformation Through a Transactional Approach to the Campus Community Partnership. And in closing, I'd like to circle back to that. When I first read Ivan Ilich's speech, I was intrigued and I was motivated, but today I'm not sure if I fully agree with it. I, I don't think international service learning should be designed around this idea of help, but I do think that students and campuses have something to offer. We just have to move past the idea that it has to be some type of tangible product or service and start, and start accepting that by adhering to these types of concepts, it actually is providing something to communities, right? It's providing a sense of pride providing a sense of empowerment. It's providing the opportunity to benefit and to be compensated. And if that's the case, it's in that mutual exchange where students are learning and communities are benefiting that we actually might achieve mutual benefit and transformation. Thank you.